Hello and welcome back to Micro Teaching with Mr Newmark. Today we'll look at this question. Why did the death of Edward the Confessor cause a succession crisis in 1066? We're going to work through seven different reasons and when we finish we're going to have a quick play around to try and work out which of these or which combination of these was the most significant. We're going to begin with English traditions regarding succession. It's important to acknowledge that these were very different to the strict rules we have governing the succession of English kings and queens today. In the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, it's probably more helpful to think of these as guidelines rather than rules. For example, it helped if you were a close blood relative of the king. It helped if you'd been identified by the previous king as the anointed successor, or if you like, the sort of preferred candidate. And thirdly, very importantly, Regardless of these two claims or these two reasons, you had to have support from the nobles. If you didn't, you wouldn't be able to govern England effectively, certainly wouldn't be able to protect it if it was attacked from foreign invasion. So, the next problem we have is the lack of a close blood heir. Edward the Confessor died without having any children. His closest relative was a 14-year-old who lived with him in his court, known as Edgar the Eighthling, meaning throne worthy. Edgar was not credible, only 14 years old and having almost no support inside England or outside, he can basically be dismissed from uh, our answer to this question for the time being. The third important factor was the wealth of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. England at this period could be described as the jewel in the crown of Europe, incredibly wealthy, very fertile. We see evidence of this still today when metal detectorists turn up uh, magnificent hordes full of helmets, torques, richly decorated acts and weapons, which shows just what a rich prize England was. This is important because it's unlikely that three powerful men would have risked so much had England not offered such a rich reward. The first of the candidates we have is Harold Godwinson. Harold Godwinson is the strongest of England's earls and close to Edward the Confessor, in fact married to Edward the Confessor's sister. He also enjoyed the support of the Witan, the Anglo-Saxon earls and important members of the church who made significant decisions in England. Most importantly, Harold claims that on his deathbed, Edward gave England to him. This clashes with the claim of William of Normandy. Edward the Confessor spent 20 years in exile in Normandy and it is likely that he promised William that William could be the king after his death. This may have been confirmed. Edward the Confessor sent Harold on an embassy to Normandy in 1064. And the Bayer tapestry certainly shows Harold swearing an oath over the relics of dead saints, appearing to suggest that he had promised his own loyalty, not to himself, but to William. We should note at this point, though, that Harold may have felt that such an oath, even if it took place, was under duress, because while he lived with William, he was, in effect, his prisoner. We might wonder why Edward created such a confused situation. Why didn't he clear up who he wanted to become king after him and make it easier here? It's possible this was deliberate. Confirming a successor came with problems as well as solutions. If he had promised William, for example, the throne and made that clearer, this could have prompted a rebellion from the earls led by Harold, and this would, rebellion would have created uncertainty in England, which would have been viewed almost certainly by the Vikings as an opportunity to invade and raid as they do. Which leads us neatly to Harold Hardrada. Harold Hardrada's claim is weak, based on the belief that England was a Viking colony because of a series of invasions that had taken place over the past few hundred years. Stronger is Hardrada's motive. It's important to remember that Hardrada was culturally Viking, and Vikings believed that what you took by force was yours to keep by rights. So it's likely that Harold Hardrada's motivation is more simply that he sees the uncertainty in England at this time and sees that as an opportunity. 
Now, before we look at which of these factors was most significant, I just want to, to look at something that might be an unhelpful way of considering this question. When students are taught this when they're younger, lessons often encourage them to try to work out who the right king is. I'm going to suggest that that's a bad idea because it invites presentism and implies that there was one right successor that would have been accepted by all. No. Given their backgrounds and cultures, it's more likely that each of the contenders strongly believed that they were the rightful king of England from their own point of view. And trying to work out if there was a right one sends us down a, a blind alley, um, a cul-de-sac. Uh, it, it's a red herring. More helpful might be to have a play around with counterfactuals. To try and work out which of these was most significant, have a go at changing each of these slightly and seeing if that makes a difference to the question. By doing that, you've got a better idea of working out which was significant. Here's an example. Let's assume that Edward had lasted for another 10 years. Edgar was 24 years old, had built up support, was a strong, respected warrior. If those things were true, perhaps the succession crisis might have been headed off because this part of the traditions would have been a much stronger uh, and more compelling argument. I encourage you to pause the video, go through each of the reasons that I've discussed, have a play around with the counterfactuals and try and work out which of these or which combination of these you think personally was the most significant in causing the succession crisis of 1066. Thank you very much for listening. More videos to follow.